What do particle physicists have in common with cartoon race cars, Top Gun fighter pilots, and blue hedgehogs? They all like to go very fast. In order to create Higgs bosons, you have to accelerate and collide particles. In this video, we're going to ask why do we need to accelerate particles and how do we do it? In the end, we're going to be looking at the Large Hadron Collider, the world's most powerful particle accelerator that was used in the hunt for the Higgs. So why do we need particle colliders? Well, particle physicists are predominantly interested in answering two questions. What is the universe made out of? And what forces cause that stuff to stick together and fall apart? One way to find out what something's made of is to break it and see what comes out. That's why sometimes people describe particle colliders as smashers. And it all sounds very clumsy, but there is actually a lot of rigorous science here. Also, if you want to know what forces hold matter together, you can collide two particles and watch how they interact. For instance, this is a Feynman diagram showing one electron scattering off of another electron due to the electromagnetic interaction. Now, there are other interactions that could take place here, but they only become important at high energies. And that's one reason why we want to accelerate particles to give them as much energy as we can possibly give them. You can think of this in two ways. One is to ask, how do we look at smaller and smaller objects? Robert Hooke was the first person to coin the term cell for describing biological organisms that he saw through his microscope. Now an optical microscope like this works by reflecting visible light off of the sample and then through a series of lenses into your eye. This works well for looking at most biological cells, but if you want to look at even smaller objects, you run into a problem. Visible light has a wavelength that's a few hundred nanometers long. This means it's too big to look at objects that are only a few nanometers or smaller. One solution is just to use light with really small wavelengths, like x-rays, but this can only get you so far. So instead, we use wave-particle duality. Now, this is often described as some kind of weird paradox where waves act like particles and particles act like waves. But in fact, it's not really a paradox. You see, our best current description of the universe uses quantum fields. Now, these quantum fields are not waves and they're not particles, but sometimes they look like waves and sometimes they look like particles. What this means is that particles, like the electron, have a wavelength. To find this wavelength, you can use the equation named after this chap, Louis de Broglie, de Broglie, de Broccoli? The de Broglie equation says that the wavelength is equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum. Now, since particles like the electron have mass, they typically have far larger momenta than photons. This means they have far smaller wavelengths. So intuitively, particles with higher momenta can see smaller details. But the other reason that we want particles to have as high energy as possible is to do with those Feynman diagrams we saw earlier. These diagrams can be used to calculate the probability that some process happens. Now, for heavy particles, like the Higgs boson, this probability is strongly dependent on the energy of the collision. The higher the energy of the collision, the more likely it is that you make a Higgs boson. So the more Higgs bosons that you can make every day, month, year, and so on. So that's why we want to accelerate particles, to give them as much energy as possible. But how do we actually achieve this? Some of the earliest particle accelerators were so-called cathode ray tubes, or CRTs. If you're old enough, like me, you'll remember CRT computer monitors and TVs, back in the day before fancy LCD and plasma screens. Now, a CRT has a positively charged end, the anode, 
and a negatively charged end, the cathode. This means there's an electric field between the two. If there's an electron in that field, it will be attracted to the positive charge and repelled from the negative charge. The amount of energy it's gained is equal to the charge multiplied by the voltage. So an electron in one volt gains an amount of energy we call one electron volt, one EV. Increasing the voltage increases the acceleration, but you can only increase the voltage so far until even the air breaks down and conducts electricity. And at that point, you get light. So not exactly very safe. Another drawback to CRTs is that they only accelerate particles for a brief time. This would be a bit like giving a Formula One car 10 seconds of fuel. It just wouldn't have the time to reach the necessary high speeds. Now, you could stick many of these CRTs together. The problem is, once the particle is past the first set of electrodes, it's now being pulled back rather than pushed forwards. This is deceleration, not acceleration. So the solution is to wait until the particle is past the first set of electrodes and then to switch the positive and negative charges. Now the particle is always being pushed forwards to the next set of electrodes. These kind of linear accelerators, or line acts, are widely used, but they are limited by their length. What if instead we use a magnetic field to keep the particles going in a circular path so we can keep accelerating them? This is the idea behind a type of accelerator called a cyclotron. Pretty simply, you've got two halves of a circle called Ds. One is positively charged and the other is negatively charged, so that a particle like an electron is accelerated in the gap. Now, a magnetic field keeps the particle on a circular path, and just like the other accelerators, the electric field is switched so that the particle is always being accelerated. Now, this continues and the particle gains more and more energy, and as its speed increases, the radius of that circle increases, until eventually the particle is ejected at high energy and we can use it in experiments. Cyclotrons are a very common type of particle accelerator, but they too are limited by their size. If we want to reach even higher speeds, we need a larger path for the particles to travel around. That leads to our final type of accelerator, synchrotrons, like the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC. The LHC is huge, at 27 kilometers in circumference. It's located in a tunnel about 100 meters underground near Geneva. In fact, the LHC is so big that it straddles the border between Switzerland and France. It's called the Large Hadron Collider because, well, it collides hadrons, which is a general term for particles made from quarks. Most of the time, the LHC collides two beams of protons but one or both of those beams can be swapped out for heavy ions such as lead ions. Particles are accelerated using a similar technology to those we've seen before. However, each time the particles come around to be accelerated again, they're traveling faster. This means that the frequency that we oscillate the electric field has to be synchronized with the particle's velocity, hence the name synchrotron. It's also necessary to adjust the magnetic fields so that they are synchronized with the particle's velocity as well. A faster particle needs a stronger magnetic field to keep it going around on the same path. The LHC has many different kinds of superconducting magnets. Dipole magnets are used to keep the particles going around in a circle, and more complicated magnets are used to focus the beam into a very small area. Let's follow the path of a proton all the way to a collision. The easiest way to get a proton is to start with hydrogen. Now, you may remember from chemistry that a hydrogen atom is made from one proton and one electron. In fact, all of the protons that were used to discover the Higgs boson in 2012 
came from this single bottle of hydrogen. Heating up this hydrogen will ionize it. That means remove the electrons. And now we're ready to start accelerating the leftover protons. The first step is a small linear accelerator and then a series of progressively larger synchrotrons. First, the proton synchrotron booster, then the proton synchrotron, then the super proton synchrotron, and finally the LHC. You can think of this kind of like the gears in a manual transmission car. Each of these synchrotrons is designed to take particles at a lower energy and accelerate them to higher speeds. Once in the LHC, it takes about 20 minutes to ramp up the energy to a maximum, and then the beams are forced to collide at four points around the ring, each with its own experiment. There's ATLAS, CMS, LHCB, and ALICE. When the protons collide here, there are many different types of interactions that can happen, including the production of Higgs bosons. This was a lot of effort to make Higgs bosons but we still need to actually detect the particles. We'll talk about detectors in the next video, but for now, thanks so much for watching. Let me know in the comments your thoughts and questions. And until next time, it's goodbye from me. Goodbye.